Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this week's virtual bank clinic. My name is Bill Lefter. I'm with University of Florida IFAS Extension Service here in Hernando County. And joining me today to help answer everybody's questions is Colby, who is our Hernando County Florida Friendly Landscape Coordinator. Good morning, Colby. How are you? Good morning, Bill. I'm doing good. And also joining us is Bernie, who is one of our Master Gardener volunteers here in Hernando County. Good morning, Bernie. How are you? Good morning, guys. I'm just great. Quite great to be here. And all three of us are here on time, but it almost wasn't that way because my I would normally be in my office at the other end of the building with lighting and my nice big screen and everything else, but my computer is being worked on. So I'm relegated to the back room with unusual lighting. Hopefully I don't have too much glare going on here. Uh, Colby popped on just 15 seconds before we went on, but hey, he was on time. So that's all that counts. And Bernie's mouse wasn't working about three minutes ago. Oh, goodness. So, but hey, we're all here, guys. And if you have any lawn and garden questions, go ahead and post them in the comments. That is why we're here. We're here to answer your questions, to discuss whatever kind of lawn and garden and turf grass and trees and flowers and vegetable and fruit tree kind of questions you have, along with any other questions as far as water resources, natural resources. We were going to have a special guest on today, um, Hannah Brinkley from uh, a local uh, it's Chinsega Conservation Center. She's the director there, and she's going to talk about wildlife. Since last week, we had a lot of questions about wildlife, and none of us are the expert. I am not your wildlife expert, and we're just kind of scratching our heads with some of them. So, hey, let's have Hannah on to clear it all up. Hannah wasn't able to make it today, but we'll have her back on. She's been on before, and she's always a great guest. She knows animals a lot better than I do. So good morning, everybody. Good morning, Cindy. How are you doing? Good morning, buddy. Good morning, Bill. Great to see that we have some people on here today. And uh, Colby and Bernie, I never had a chance to mention to you, we are broadcasting live on yet another venue. We are live or should be live if everything is working correctly on uh, University of Florida Central District Extension YouTube channel. So we're going to start oh, wow. broadcasting on there also. What's well, another one? We already have, uh, what's that, the fourth one, I think? Simulcast? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so we have a total of four on here now. And hopefully we'll get some regular viewers from there. And, of course, for everybody, no matter how you're watching us, whether it's Facebook, whether it's YouTube, just go ahead and put your questions in the comments. And we should be able to see them and answer them and go ahead and share them on the screen with everybody else so that, you know, everybody can learn together. That's kind of the, the goal of why we do this. You know, one of the things that, that I think would be an appropriate topic today would be uh, what to do about bugs on a, a year average, probably the, the number one thing by a factor of 10 is lawn problems. But the number two thing turns out to be bugs, either bugs in the house or bugs in the garden. And uh, I don't think we've, we've had a really comprehensive discussion on what to do about bugs. Uh, you know, this, this is the time of the year it's starting to get cold. The bugs want to get a little warm. Uh, some of the bugs start showing up in the house. Some of the bugs are in the house and uh, people don't understand how they get there. The uh, uh, filth flies, uh, the uh, pantry pest, uh, some of the roaches uh, get questions about millipedes. That, uh, that seems to be one that panics people. And, uh, you know, the, the prevention is probably a lot easier than the cure, but uh, it, people need to understand uh, how to do a cure and, and, and especially how to do a prevention. And then uh, if, if you're gardening and you have all these holes show up in the plants, uh, what do you do? And, and generally, 
Uh, the most toxic chemical is not the very best thing for a garden. So uh, instead of grabbing salmon as first, uh, first thing to use, uh, you know, uh, explain that if you've got caterpillars, BT is, is a, a harmless product. And, and you know, let's, let's cover uh, a, a lot of the different insect problems and, and the cures and put it all in one program. How's that sound to you guys? Sounds good to me. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> it's, it, 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 it all depends on what kind of insect pests you want to talk about because it's funny. A lot of people move to Florida and they think that you're just overwhelmed with insects here. And I see questions a, a lot of times on social media. People ask just simply, what does everybody else on here use for bugs? And that's, that's a really open-ended question. Do you have bugs in your lawn? Bugs on your ornamental plants? Uh, bugs on your vegetable garden? Do you have bugs in your garage? There are all kinds of different bugs. And I could tell you, before we go anywhere else, before we talk about any control, what to use, what not to use, what works best, you have to identify what your bug problem is. And a lot of people skip that and they just start jumping at all the other things. I want to use, you know, I use neem oil and you should do this and spray this. If you don't know what your problem is, we can't go any farther until we stop and figure out what your problem is. Because I don't make pesticide recommendations on on imaginary bugs or just bugs in general. That's too too generic. We need to get more specific. Well, I, I think probably the, the place to start would be uh, one that, that's pretty simple, and that's the uh, centipede millipede thing. Uh, if, if you put mulch right up to the house, uh, those are, are insects that, that are they're actually, not actually insects even, but they're, they're a, a little critter that uh, likes woody things. And uh, you've, you've created the uh, perfect situation for them uh, by bringing the mulch right up to the front door. And uh, so naturally when it's warm, uh, you open the front door if there's any space under the front door. Those little mm -hmm. guys just take advantage of it. Uh, they're, they're really not a harmful thing, but, uh, you know, it, it's easier to prevent them getting into the house uh, than it is to do something about them. Because basically, you just have to hunt them down and, and kill them. And, and mechanical kill, you know, use your shoe, uh, a, a broom and sweep them up and throw them back out. They're, they're, they're beneficial in the overall scheme of things. They're, they're, terrifying when you're in there in your house so in, improper mulching which is something that uh, uh, northern people don't understand uh, that, that's probably the first place to start on what are we going to do to, to prevent it and those those same wooden things uh, those same mulch pieces are also going to attract termites so yeah I, there we go see we've got yeah and I, you know I, it, it just so happens that we have a very, very good University of Florida fact sheet on um, preventing household pests or preventing pests from entering your house. Teresa, if you want to try looking that up, I'm one of the co-authors and our county extension director, Jim Davis, is one of the co-authors. Um, and it, there's a lot of preventative things that you can do in your landscape to help minimize these kind of problems having plants right up against your house, touching your house, tree branches, palm tree limbs, touching your roof is very bad. Leaves a perfect little pathway for pests. Anything from roaches to insects, all the way up to larger things, you know, rats and mice, gives them a very good pathway to get to your house and to your roof. Um, properly pruning bushes to kind of um, limit the number of hiding spaces you're providing for those little animals also. So there's a lot of preventative things you can do in your yard. And remember, if one day you see a single millipede or a single um, insect in your house, don't flip out and go nuclear and figure, I need to call service and have them come out and spray my house every 30 days because I'm being overrun. Because if you only see one, you're really not being overrun. Very important that you figure out what it is. Because I know, Bernie, we have seen in our office 
people bring in things like bed bugs. If you get bed bugs, you need to call a professional because that's bad. And they have the um, equipment and the uh, uh, materials to be able to control it. If you have German cockroaches, if you get them for some reason, very bad. The jug with a little squirt handle that you buy at the grocery store and you wander around the house spraying the baseboards, that ain't going to fix it because they will, they love living inside your house. If you have a random Australian cockroach, also known as a palmetto bug, the really, really big ones, it's probably, if it's during the summer, it's probably not a problem. They wandered in from outside. So, you know, very, very important that you identify these things to, um, oh, here we go. Teresa found a link and she put it in the comments for, for an excellent document there um, with my name on it also. Landscaping methods to help prevent pests from entering your home. So prevent, prevention, very, very important. You know, one of the other things that uh, people get really concerned with uh, on entering their home is ants. And I, I get a lot of people that uh, really are concerned about having ants in their yard. And the truth is, if you've got a yard, you've got ants. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it makes sense to take drastic measures to get rid of fire ants. They can be a problem if you've got kids or animals. But, you know, if you have routine little ants, uh, they aren't hurting anything to speak of. Uh, they're out tending to their aphids. And, and uh, if, if you take care of the plants that have got aphid problems, uh, the ants really aren't going to cause you a problem. Uh, the, the fire ants, there are some very good fire ant baits. Unfortunately, nobody seems to ever read the instructions on how to make the ant bait work. So you, you buy a, a, a package of Amdro and you go out and you pour half the package right on the nest and it does absolutely no good whatsoever. And, uh, you know, if, if you follow the instructions, the instructions say use a little bit away from the uh, nest, they will... Uh, pick it up and take it into the nest. If you put it on top of the nest, they look at it as, as trash that somebody dumped on them and they get rid of it. So you just totally eliminate what you're trying to, to accomplish uh, by not following the instructions. And boy, is that true of everything that you use uh, chemical wise. You know, if, if it kills something, if, if it's going to do a benefit for you, make sure that you follow those instructions. Exactly. If you want to get the best results, follow the directions. More is not necessarily better. And not every ant in your yard is a fire ant either. We do have fire ants, but we have lots of other species of ants in the yard, many of which are just an important part of the ecosystem. They're not necessarily a problem. The household ones, and I think I have ghost ants in the house again, which but ghost ants, if you want to see a tiny little ant, you have to literally look around and the light has to shine on it just right so you can even see it. They're so tiny. Um, a product like Taro is going to work very well for those indoor sugar hunting and sugar feeding kind of ants. So, um, like I said, identification is very important. If you do ever have an ant problem, if you can bring us samples and give us a description of what's going on. This, I, these ants are in my yard, they're in my house. I have a huge, they have 10 huge piles. I have just one, you know, give us some background information and we'll help you figure out what your ant problem is. But not every ant problem has to be fixed. You know, I got ants in my yard. Most of them I just ignore, they're fine. Yeah, it, it's kind of interesting when you've got a, a ant trail uh, in the house and, and there's a hundred ants running back and forth on the trail. You know, if, if you clean up what they're going to, uh, maybe spray the, the uh, ants with one of the sprays. But the important thing is you need to get rid of the pheromone trail. There, there's They've laid down a little path so everybody can follow it. And as long as the little path is there, they're going to go back and forth. So uh, cleanliness is very important. And, and one of the things that... that I think people don't understand with roaches particularly is that they come in in cardboard boxes 
uh, the, the, the holes in corrugated cardboard uh, are just like a natural attractant. So if, if, if you bring something in and it's in a cardboard box, take it out of the cardboard box. Make sure that you don't introduce any insects. Take the boxes back outside. Don't store uh, cardboard boxes, especially boxes that have ever had food in them. Uh, uh, big problem. And, and uh, your, your friends up north, when you ship something to them for Christmas, uh, the, the cardboard box you picked up behind the uh, grocery store, or behind the liquor store or whatever, and, and ship uh, you just shipped your friends uh, some roaches at the same time. So, uh, yeah. if, if you want, if you want to be uh, on the safe side, really be careful with with cardboard boxes. They're they're probably the biggest hiding place, and and one of the least thought about, and, and very 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 important that you're careful with your boxes. Yeah, and most species of roaches here in Florida really do not prefer living inside your house unless you provide them with a ton of cardboard, a garage full of papers, old um, Reader's Digest going back to the 1960s, uh, filing cabinets full of paper, and dampness, you know, if it's leaking a little bit underneath your kitchen sink or a bathroom sink and it's wet because then you've just created a perfect home for them and they're more than happy to come in and live there when you provide those things. So keep everything dry, try to limit the uh, cardboard and the paper and limit their, which is their food source and realize that they are probably, you're gonna get a few that wander in from outside, especially during the summer. But if you see just one or two, don't panic thinking that you have a million of them because you probably don't. Unless they're German cockroaches or Asian cockroaches, because they like living in your house. So that's why I de go. It all, it all always goes back to identification. We need to figure out what we're dealing with here, what kind of insect we're dealing with. So Colby, yeah. you will eventually be getting emails and questions and stuff about uh, insects and pests. And, uh, and like Teresa put a publication here, the innocent Florida woods roach. They're the ones that get really big, really wide. They're pretty flat and they, they never get wings on them. Even the adults don't have wings, but they live out in the forest underneath logs. Go out today, go on a hike, start rolling over logs. You're going to find one out in the forest. They don't get in your house. They don't want to live there unless you live in the woods around a log because that is what they like. They don't like the, the normal situations inside of a house. It, you know, if you, if you take and, and use uh, wood, like you, you cut up an old oak tree. And, and so then you've got these, these pieces and you start using them for decorations around the house. It's amazing how many things live in a, in a piece of dead log. So, uh, you know, if, if, if you want to do that, keep them far away from the house because otherwise you're inviting things to be there that, that don't really want to be in the house. But, uh, you know, if, if, if you're there uh, two feet or three feet from a, an entrance to the building, uh, okay, occasionally somebody wanders into the building, whether they do it on purpose or by accident. Mm -hmm. And it is a problem, you know. It, there again, if, if you're a, a, somebody from up north, uh, you cut down a tree and, and you make some little log things for decorations and they last 30 years. Here, you do the exact same thing and it lasts 18 months and then it just totally crumbles and, and a million little critters move on to the next log somewhere else. So, uh, you know, the, the environment is just completely different. And, uh, it, it, it's amazing how quick uh, these things do happen. And, and it, mm -hmm. by the same token, uh, if, if you don't like uh, caterpillars, you can't have butterflies. And, and that's one of the big things we, we hear. People don't like the fact that caterpillars are chewing up their landscaping. And then how do I do a, a, a butterfly garden? Well, you know, you, you can't have it both ways. If you if you don't want any caterpillars, 
then you don't want any butterflies. So uh, there, there's a real simple thing that that works on almost all caterpillars. It's called BT. Uh, it zaps them. And it, it, it is something that stops them from feeding. And, and if you don't eat, you don't live. And it, it's totally harmless to humans. So uh, if, if you do have caterpillars of, of some kind, maybe they're, they're producing moths you don't like or, or something like that, use a product like BT. Don't, don't go out and start with malathion or seven right off the bat. Uh, you're going to end up poisoning the, the drinking water. You're going to end up poisoning a lot of things. Uh, a lot of other insects by mistake that that you really don't want to damage. And, you know, uh, when when you move here and you hate insects, they they were here before you were. <laughs> and they were here a lot, a lot longer than I've been here. So, uh, yeah, they've been here for a while. And and a lot of them serve a really useful purpose. It, it It's amazing. Uh, you know, if all the insects were gone, all the people would be gone. We, we really are interdependent. We, we have to have them. Uh, some of them are pollinators. Uh, some of them are taking care of the bad things for us. Uh, and some of them are just there. Some of them, uh, very mm. few, 1% is, is the, the number that's always banded about. 1% are bad, 99% are good. So, uh, you know, if you, if you want to kill the, the 1%, don't kill the 99 percent at the same time be selective uh you know the soapy water horticultural soap spray is going to solve your your aphid problem on on a plant uh why spray something that's going to kill every living thing that that exists so you know. yeah over spraying it does really um take a toll on beneficial insects and I've seen people when they start overspraying, they throw things so out of whack. Now they have an outbreak of a pest that they've never had a problem with before. Then they have an outbreak of something else that was never a problem before. When you start to throw things out of balance really badly, it, you're, you don't solve your problems. So once again, going back to proper identification, once we figure out what your problem is, very easy to come up with suggestions and ways to deal with it that are um, low toxicity and you know safe for you to use. Always follow the directions because even these um, uh, things like horticultural soap, uh, neem oil, things like that, you obviously don't want to get it all over yourself, and you don't want to be you know breathing it in. You know, oh, hey, this stuff smells pretty good. I'm going to breathe it in. Or obviously, you don't want to be drinking it or getting it on your hands and eating potato chips. So follow all the different uh, directions that are on the package as far as what kind of safety equipment to be wearing, whether it be gloves, eye protection, um, long pants, shoes, not flip-flops or bare feet to be safe. But many things can be used very safely if you follow the directions and they can be effective. And it's only going to target pretty much what you want to control. It's not going to kill everything in your yard. Some people just want to go scorched earth, I think, and they think that that um, they can control everything in their yard. It's like, okay, I want to keep the birds. I want to keep the pretty butterflies because I like them. And I'll keep the kids and I'll keep the dog. Everything else has to die. And that never works out well. <laughs> it doesn't work out well for us as a community or a society and doesn't usually work out well in your yard either. Weird things start to happen, and then people call us last, and we're just kind of shouldn't have done that. Bernie, I'm sure that you've heard some pretty wacky stories over time. You know, we need to have a special episode where we have a couple other guests on from Extension and have everybody share one of the craziest situations that they've ever been presented with. Because I know I, I can think of a few. <laughs> I had a, a, a couple with pantry pests. Mm -hmm. And and he was convinced that the reason they had uh, these little insects in the flower uh, was she was not a clean person and, and that it was her fault. And they'd been married for 30 years and he was really tired. And, and I could tell that this was one of those things where if, if you gave him any talking point at all, he was going to go home and continue berating her. 
So I, I pulled the uh, publication on, on pantry pest and, and explained it that this is something that was in the flower when they bought it. And, and those little black beetles were not a sign that, that she had not kept the, the place clean. I said that, that those little beetles were going to show up no matter what. And, and, and pantry pests are a real problem because people panic when they see them and, and they think it's like roaches that, that you know, we, we need to do something to control them. Well, basically, uh, the box that they came in, uh, if, if you get rid of that box, uh, and maybe some other um, products that were right next to it in mm -hmm. the pantry, pretty well cleans them up. That That's not a continuing problem. So if, if you run into the things in your flour or in, in your cereal or whatever, I mean, the truth is they snuck in with the flour or the cereal yeah. or, and they're just there. They're not really a problem. It, They'll, they'll go away when you you take the contaminated products out. I think the only time I've had a problem with that is I got rice weevils. And they're pretty cool. It's a really small little weevil. And I figured out what it was very quickly, got rid of the contaminated rice because it had obviously come from the grocery store and contaminated rice. It happens, not very often, but it happens. And cleaned the pantry out really, really well with bleach spray, threw away anything else that the weevils were in or on. Problem solved, never, problem never came back. And I think probably the one I see it most often on is dog food. You ever seen that where people get oh, weevils yeah. in dog food, dry yeah. dog food? Yeah, yeah, it happens. And, and it's not because that, you know, you're not a clean person, you don't keep a clean house. When you brought a bag of contaminated dog food in, that's what they came in on. And they're pretty, they're, they're fairly easy to get rid of. If you know, if you have an idea of what the pest is, um, a lot of University of Florida publications on that, we can help with identification. Pretty easy for us to identify. What, what about the uh, little flies that come out of your, your uh, bathroom drain? Uh, what do you do about those? Haven't seen those for a while and they're really very common. They could be either forid flies, P-H-O-R-I-D flies, also known as coffin flies. That's kind of a scary name. Or drain moths. And drain moths, believe it or not, they're really tiny, but if you look at them under a microscope, it's a real moth with a little, you know, fuzzy moth wings. They can live in your um, sinks and your drains down in the pipes because your pipes will get goop on them. I don't know if that's the technical term for it, but they get goop on them. And people think, oh, well, I'll just dump a bunch of bleach down there. Well, your pipes, because they have the P-trap in the elbow, just dumping bleach down doesn't coat the entire pipe. There are products that you can buy online, insecticides made for this. You pour it in your sink around the drain, and it's kind of like, it's thick like pancake syrup. And overnight, it slowly goes down the drain and coats the entire drain. Follow the directions. I think you have to put a, a, a cover container over it overnight. And overnight, it slowly coats the pipes, gets rid of the goop, which gets rid of the food supply for those flies and moths. So that's how you get rid of them. Running through the house, swatting at them and trying to kill them when you see them flying around, gets rid of the adults, but there's more in your sink that are coming. So that if you try doing that, you're doing that forever. You never get rid of it. You have to find where they're coming from. You have to find their food source. You have to find where they're breeding and take care of it at the source. You know, if you have um, a problem with a septic system, like your, um, your pipes and everything drain down and you have a cracked pipe somewhere between the end of your, your last toilet or last drain in your house and the septic tank, you can get them at that point. And without replacing that pipe, you'll never get rid of them. I don't know if anybody that that's happened to, but I did read that, that, you know, if you, so if you're ever dealing with somebody who like the problem just never goes away, what do I do to get rid of them? They keep coming back. It may be a broken pipe underground because that that's where they're breeding now. 
I, I think one of the, the, the funnier ones that I've had, and, and I've had it probably three times at this point, is lizards in the toilet. And, and I, I had this one woman that was hysterical. She, she called and, and wanted to know what she was going to do. They must be in the septic system. Oh, my God, this is terrible. And the world has come to an end. Uh, I just saw this mammoth lizard. And, well, the, the truth is they, they come down the vent pipe off your roof. Mm -hmm. and, and once they come down the vent pipe, then they go over. And when they go through the trap, they they pop up. Uh, and there they are swimming around in your, your toilet. And uh, they, they can't really get out because there's a lip on the toilet that stops them from being able to climb out. So uh, all they can do at, at that point is swim around. They're air breathing. They don't want to go back through the trap and, and uh, they just become a problem. But that that's one of those things. Uh, there should be a screen over the vent on your roof. And, and if funny animals show up in, in your uh, toilet water, yeah, it's probably because that screen is either missing or it's damaged. So, yeah. Yeah. If that screen ever gets totally blocked, that causes problems. Also, you're not venting correctly. Yeah. Colby, do you ever have any insect problems? Any, any bugs in the new house? Uh, you know, from time to time I'll get, we'll have a, I actually do get some palmetto bugs uh, in my house from time to time, and I live in a neighborhood. It's it's pretty strange, but I, I'm not really sure where they come from. But I'll, I'll get them every now and then, and uh, you know, my girlfriend starts freaking out. She's like, "You gotta get it! I gotta drop what I'm doing to get this." And it and it's you know, once every every three weeks or something, I'll have one, and I get it and put it outside, and I'm like. There's if you knew how many bugs were around you at any given time, and you're freaking out about this one, you would go crazy. There's it, they are everywhere. There are I guarantee you everybody has probably hundreds of thousands of insects in a you know in a hundred yard radius of them. So just just cool it. They're 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 around you. They're going to be around you. You live in a world that has trillions of insects. And if you if you're freaking out about one, I, I would hate for you to know actually how many there were. You'd probably be really upset. Yeah, you don't want to focus on necessarily everything that exists around you. When you throw in bacteria and fungi and viruses, <laughs> it, 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 we live in a scary world. Sometimes we're not going to focus on that though. <laughs> we are happy to focus on your insect pest problems or lawn and garden problems. So please feel free to go ahead and put them in the chat. If you're watching this as a recording after the fact, uh, we're going to show all of our contact information at the end. So feel free to shoot us an email, send pictures, lots of pictures. I tell people there's no such thing as too many pictures. It really helps us get an idea of what is going on so we can better identify what your insect is or identify the plant or the disease or whatever the situation calls for. So we're going to show our, um, let me go ahead and start showing our contact information right now. So if you ever need to get a hold of me, there's my email. Like I said, there's no such thing as too many pictures. Things get really busy and hectic sometimes. I probably, if you're lucky and I have a few minutes and it's an easy question, I email right back. Otherwise, it might take a day or two or three uh, to get back with you. Um, here we have Colby's email. And if you've ever liked to uh, follow uh, Colby's Facebook page, uh, he's been doing a lot of Facebook Live classes, um, recorded classes, everything else. All the information for all the different links to his Facebook and everything else are right there on Linktree. Mm -hmm. So you can go ahead um, and put that down and check that out. I uh, I feel kind of bad. I missed two. I missed a live class last week. Uh, I just got swamped 
I can I I had no time. And then this week I'm off tomorrow, or we're all off. I think you, you you're probably off too for uh, Veterans yeah, Day. So it's we're like well, closed tomorrow. So don't call yeah, us here yeah. tomorrow. We're closed. If you call me or send me an email, I will not answer until Monday. I promise. Um, so I I missed two weeks in a row, and I feel really bad about it. But um, that just means that uh, I'll have plenty of stuff to talk about uh, next Friday. <laughs> Yeah, I think as we get closer to the new year, we need to plan. Well, I know that we're planning on doing a lot more on social media, a lot more Facebook Live. Short classes, how-to things, anything from reels that last like a minute up to longer live classes. So follow us on Facebook. We always have a lot of exciting things going on. Here is our office phone number. So if you'd like to ever get in contact with Bernie, Bernie is here on Thursdays. And you can give him a call. You can stop by the office. You can email us with, you know, your pictures and your question. He's more than happy to help out. And here's our Facebook page. The short short name is Hernando EXT if you're searching on Facebook. So be sure to like us, follow us. Every time we're doing something, it, it goes on Facebook. So if you follow us real close on Facebook, you're going to see every different thing that we have going on. And... Colby and I generally share things. I've fallen behind on that, haven't I? Remind me sometimes to go on your Facebook to be sure that I share your events on our page. And if you could do the same, that'd be great. Oh, yeah. Well, to be fair, uh, like I said, I miss <laughs> I miss two weeks of live classes. So there hasn't been any. I have a Rain Barrel workshop up right now um, that's supposed to be on the 20th. But with it being around Thanksgiving, I think that that one yeah. may, get, may get pushed back. Uh, based off of the number of people that have signed up right now, um, but other than that, I I I do I try I try to post the events when I do anything, but it just gets it's like man, uh, you, get, you get rolling all you get rolling and then you you you, you miss them here and there. I try to share you, you guys' stuff as well. Yeah, hey, one of, don't one of the forget that we've really had a tremendous number of questions on. And, and it isn't really that big a problem is grasshoppers during during the summer uh i mean generally we get four or five a week just on grasshoppers alone a few years ago we had an outbreak on the uh, eastern part of the county that was so severe uh, uh we'd talked to the uh, university about it and they said we don't really get involved until the grasshoppers start eating the screens. And I thought they were joking. <laughs> and two days later, a woman called and she said, the grasshoppers here are so bad, they're eating my screens. So we, we called and uh, they, they scheduled to come down. And, and at the same time they scheduled to come down, uh, uh, flock of birds of, of uh, there were kites swallowtail kites yeah moved in and started eating the the and when the kites showed up about 10 other uh, varieties of birds also showed up but but it it started with this this colony of maybe 200 uh, swallowtail kites and it just got bigger and bigger and they went through and they pretty well cleaned them all out so that that spot it was on Powerline Road. Uh, uh, pretty well got cleaned out by the birds, and, and we didn't end up having to do anything. But mm -hmm. uh, And those, those were not lubber grasshoppers. So lubber grasshoppers don't do that. That's the uh, American bird. Bird. Schistocerca americana grasshopper, which they're the ones that fly. And you'll see them, you know, you'll see them in fields mostly. You, you don't see them very often in somebody's residential yard. You can. Um, and they're always, they're out every summer. They're, they're not particularly destructive. It's not really a lawn and garden pest. But every 20 years or so, their population will just go through the roof for a summer until all the natural predators that would normally eat it all figure it out and they all come to town. And I remember with the kites, um, I think the Audubon Society was out there and there were a bunch of people out in that area with cameras because you would normally never see that many swallowtail kites all together at once. So it was a real 
of that. But it didn't last. It went away pretty quickly. It was, I'm sure, nobody, you know, lost their life or their house or all their trees or lawn or anything like that. It's just one of those things that happens outdoors sometimes. It was terrible to drive on it. It was, I went out there and it, they were just totally covering the road. It, it was amazing that there were that many insects in one spot. Well, that's like the cicadas up north. The, um, what is a 17 year? 17 year locust, yeah. Yeah, because I grew up in Maryland and when I was a kid, I remember them coming out once or twice. And people, they'll, they'll be all over the road. And you jam on the brakes and you'll go sideways like you're driving through snow. So it actually was uh, um, hazardous, but they come, they go, they don't really destroy anything. We have so many different seasonal pests here, right here in Hernando County, that for a couple of weeks, we'll just be getting, you know, we'll get phone calls and people come in, they bring in a jar of samples. It's, it, don't worry about that. They're going to be gone in a week or two. Chidera bugs, good example. They're only around for a couple weeks, and then they're gone for the rest of the year. Well, what do I spray? Nothing. Just turn a blind eye. Go on, Go to the beach for a couple of weeks. And when you come home from the beach, they're going to be gone. You won't have a problem with them. What about garden insects? What, what do we do uh, with pickle worms or something like that? that you know, you, 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 you're growing cucumbers. And all at once you find out you've got little worms. Uh, is, is there anything you can do? or You have to grow the cucumbers at the right time of year when the pickle worms are not here. Because they are invasive. They've been in Florida, in the U.S. for many, many years. In the winter, they get frozen back all the way back to the uh, South Florida, down around Homestead. Then when it warms up in the spring, they move north. And they move north. And then they end up in Hernando County in... April or May ish. And then they keep moving north. You know, they go all the way up as far up as Virginia, I think, by the end of summer. Then it gets cold and they're all killed all the way back to the southern tip of Florida. So, cucumbers, you have to grow the right time of year here. If you move to central Florida and you have a vegetable garden and you grow cucumbers June, July, and August, like you did in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Michigan, wherever you came from, they will die. You will not get any really good cucumbers. If you do, you are the one in 100 or one in 500 people who are just lucky enough for that to happen for. So please don't tell everybody else on Facebook, do it. It's easy because it's not and almost nobody is ever successful with it. That's one of the reasons why planting things at the right time of year here is so important. Good way to avoid those pests. Um, all the other insect pests in your vegetable garden are all specific. They're specific to specific crops. You're going to use a specific control. Um, many of, Some are seasonal. Some you're going to have a bad problem with because you're just growing stuff at the wrong time of year. Good example is um, during the winter, people will grow broccoli, cabbage, kale, and they all grow, and collard greens, things like that. They're all in the same plant family, and they grow great here during the winter and have very few pests. They get a few caterpillars. They're easy to take care of with a quick, quick treatment of either BT or spinosad. So caterpillars in the winter, no big problem. People will try to keep them growing until we go into spring and summer. And after a certain point, let's say May, all those crops, you're going to have harlequin bugs, you're going to have stink bugs, you're going to have Colorado potato beetles, and you're going to be overwhelmed with diseases and insect pests. That's, that's the world telling you that you're growing those things at the wrong time of year. Time to cut your losses, time to plant green beans, because that's what you grow that time of year. Time to get ready to grow calabasa, because that's what you grow in the heat of summer. Save the kale and broccoli and cabbage for next fall and grow it again during the winter. So a lot of times people have insect problems. It's kind of their own fault. Just a little knowledge, a little practice. Okay, I'm going to grow those cool season things in the winter. I'm going to grow things in the spring. 
They're going to be done by June. After June, I'm going to grow okra and calabasa and yuca. And I'm going to figure out what those things are. I'm going to try eating them. I'm going to look online for a good recipe. So I'm going to really like yuca. I'm going to grow it in the heat of summer. And I'm going to get even more food out of my backyard. Because that's the goal, isn't it? To get as much homegrown food as you can out of your backyard. So follow the rules. You'll be successful. Break all the rules. If you're really good, you can stretch them. You can be creative. You can experiment. That's all great. But if it fails, hey, you know, all the great, you know, then you're just like Thomas Edison. He failed a lot too. So don't feel bad. But that's kind of the, the long, the long explanation for dealing with insect pests in your vegetable garden. Practice, knowledge, identification, number one, most important. And other than that, you can grow a lot of stuff to eat here. What about nematodes? Nematodes are tough because homeowners have very, very few controls that are available to them. You know, there's a product, um, Monterey Nematode Control, and it's organic, and it's made from the bark of the sapidia tree, I believe. And if you mix it up, you you apply it as a soil drench and you apply it to all plants that are already in the ground growing. And it kills some of the nematodes. Others, it just really aggravates. Um, they, they, they find it extremely distasteful. It doesn't kill all of them, but it could take your nematode, your root knot nematode and other pest level from here way down to here. And that may be a big enough difference where you're going to get a crop or if you're inundated with nematodes, you're not going to get a crop. I am going to get a jug of that this summer and try it. So later on, late this spring, I'll be able to share with everybody how well it worked for me. I have root knot nematodes in my backyard garden. Even I don't have a whole lot of different things that I can use to help combat them. I've, I've never been able to grow figs because of the, the nematodes. You plant the, the, the plant, and that's as big as it's going to be. It, yep. it looks good the next year, but it doesn't gain any size. And then it just kind of dwindles down from there. And uh, it's very, very discouraging. And, uh, you know, it, it makes you realize that some things you would be better off planting them in raised beds with no contact to the ground. I usually recommend people, um, if there's any way they could do it, plant it in a container in clean soil figs if you get a big enough container like um one of the half whiskey barrels is pretty much big enough figs you know figs don't get 40 feet tall normally so they can be grown in a container if there's any way you can grow nematode sensitive things like that in a container it really helps because you won't have nematodes because you're using clean soil that doesn't have nematodes in it so guys we need to wrap it up shortly here I have my next meeting to uh, be at online at 11. So let me, if anybody has any last minute questions, comments, go ahead and throw them in the in comment section and let me roll through once again, my email. And I think we put everybody to sleep today. I think so. Quiet group today. I see there's some people watching us. So mm -hmm. either... They're in the kitchen making a sandwich, or they're watching us, but they're just being very, very quiet. Okay. Uh, what else do we have here? There is how to contact our office. If you call today, you will get a hold of Teresa. She can patch you back to Bernie if you have a question. And we don't want you to forget our Master Gardener Nursery. They're open on Wednesdays and Saturdays from 8.30 in the morning till noon. And there is her address. They are right behind the Hernando County Fairgrounds, right along State Road 41 here in Brooksville. And they have a great selection of native and Florida-friendly plants there. Very few trees, very, very few edibles. You just don't get a whole lot of, uh, you know, customers looking for different edibles, but a lot of really good ornamental plants and really good selection of native plants are going to do well in this area. 
And that's the important part. Okay, well, Buddy is listening carefully, so that's good. That's one. And Anne Marie is asking a question. Okay, that's two people who are not in the kitchen making a sandwich, I guess. So um, Anne Marie says, Bernie, have you tried a strawberry fig? I have no, two of them, nine feet tall. Brown turkey and uh, Celeste. And uh, they they don't survive. Uh, I, I tried one that uh, uh, one of the, the local people was doing a cross, and, and they did beautiful uh, at his place, and, and they were so sad at my place that uh, he decided not to sell them commercially because of that. So Yeah. Yeah, that could be for a lot of lava. different soil reasons, nematodes. There's a lot that goes into it. My strawberry guava does super out there. Okay. Well, I see a lot of people. We woke up a lot of people and brought them back from the kitchen. <laughs> yeah, they call them out. Yeah. <laughs> so now that everybody has lunch ready and you're ready to eat, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap it up here in just a second. Um, uh, hey, Colby and Bernie, I'm not going to be able to be on here next week, so... Colby, can you run things? Uh, uh, yeah, I think so. I, I do. I, I, I have a meeting on Thursday, and I'm not sure what time it is. I think it's in the afternoon, but I will, I'll get with you and uh, confirm before. Okay. We will hopefully somebody will be on here again next Thursday morning at 10 a.m. Uh, we always go ahead and make Facebook events and post it on the YouTube channels. So. Cindy's listening to us also, so we always appreciate that. <laughs> like to thank all of our regular viewers, all of our listeners. If you're brand new to this, welcome. Please be sure to come back again. We are here to do our very best in our imperfect way of answering your lawn and garden questions. If we don't know the answer, we'll find out the answer. We'll you know track down the pe person who's the expert in that field and get with you and get everything answered and worked out. So thank you so much for joining us. If you weren't on here, we probably wouldn't be on here either. I, I get really lonely if it was just me talking to myself every Thursday morning. <laughs> so with that, everybody, thank you so much. And hopefully we'll see you back here again next Thursday at 10 a.m. So please be sure to tune in and follow us. And if you're watching the recording, like I said, if you have any lawn and garden questions, feel free to email us. If you go back through the recording, I posted them on the screen several times. So hopefully we'll hear from all of you soon and enjoy the beautiful weather that we're having too. Doesn't happen year round. So take advantage of it now while you can. So, hey, everyone, thanks so much and have a great day. Bye. Bye.